Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this morning, I am uh, really going to just share a story, as I mentioned last night. This won't be a traditional teaching. I love teaching, opening scripture, exegeting the word of God. Today's going to be more of like a, a prophetic storyline of a student harvest that I've had the opportunity to serve in Middle Tennessee with a hope to inspire um, to inspire the saints for the work of the ministry, as, as well to highlight some eternal principles that the story does embody at different points. Uh, principles that I believe are transferable because they're eternal, that may you, you may find helpful and strategic for your own context. And so I've been asked to share on intergenerational partnership for kingdom impact. And I think that's why they invited me. I'm supposed to be the young guy speaker, you know, and, uh, and uh, I won't say what Joe is, but uh, I, said in the, I said in the pregame meeting, I said, he dreams dreams, I get visions, you know, and so uh, not true. <clears throat> I'm going to share a storyline from my own life, and I have been one who, um, I'm a word of the Lord guy. I, just, I really, truly desire to follow the word of the Lord to me to build my life around the God assignments and mandates that I know he's spoken to me about. That doesn't mean I take every prophetic word seriously. I travel a lot. People give me words all the time, and oftentimes I, I, I just, I, the, the, you know, Teflon. But there are times when God speaks, and I know I have to weigh a word, and then I know he invites me to take steps of faith and risk to journey with him unto fulfillment. Even more than intergenerational synergies, what you'll find in this story that, is that there are other synergies that will be highlighted as well. Um, this story goes back to 2016. In 2016, I was at the end of a, a nine, ten year period of leading um, a discipleship training school that I founded in the context of a local church. Students from all over America and different nations were spending seasons of training with us. It was like a YWAM type model training, but in a local church context. I'm a missions guy, but I'm a local church guy. In the missions world, I'm the church guy. In the church world, I'm the missions guy. So I, I, I'm that guy. I was, on, I was leading our last, what would, what would be our last mission trips. Our students didn't know this, but my wife and I had sought the Lord. We were going to end our ministry, literally close up shop, lay off staff. I, we were going to go on a 12-week sabbatical. We were going to seek the Lord over the next year and get the word of the Lord for the next season of ministry. No one else knew this except our elders and, and my wife and I. I was with a group of young people that I was leading on a mission assignment in El Salvador, a, can a country I'd visited many times before. I was sitting down with a prophetic man, my friend Juan, and he didn't know anything. And I was sitting with a couple of my students and staff, and I asked him, Juan, will you just, will you just please listen and share anything God gives you for me? He says, yeah. He says, I see something. He says, your ministry is not, it's not ending but this chapter's coming to a close. He says, there's going to be an older apostolic man he's, who's going to hear you preach, and he's going to invite you into his world. And the next season of your life is not going to be about leading schools. It's going to be about fathering leaders of young people. And I said, that's right. You know, It was a couple months later, I was sitting down with Joe Del Torrio and a mentor of mine, Steve Fry, and they were talking about the need we were talking about this need for, for young, in, in our generation for young people. And um, <clears throat> that those conversations eventually led to my transition into uh, Middle Tennessee. But it was at the end of that season, um, in that summer in 2016, part of my sabbatical. Um, we had gone public with our transition now. I went on sabbatical. I went and visited um, two friends, two sets of people, Joe Del Torrio and Steve Fry and Dent in Nashville. And then I went to Huntington Beach, California, to visit with my old pastor and mentor, Brian Brent, who founded the Circuit Riders. So I worked with him for a long time. He married my wife and I. I was the youth pastor for his children. And uh, Brian introduces me to his good friends, Andy Bird, the leader of The Send, and Amy Ward, who is a prophetic woman within YWAM, who God has used in the most marvelous way to launch movements like Circuit Riders and The Send. And... And they began to pray for me. And Amy doesn't know me from Adam. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've got dad jokes now. I'm 40. I'm 40. I'm 40. 
four kids, and uh, she look, she doesn't know me, never met them, and she says, um, she says the the young people that you have trained and discipled have all gotten older. She has no idea. I just spent the last ten years pioneering discipleship training schools. The young people who you've trained and discipled have all gotten older, but God has made you for a youth movement. You're going to move. And she says, uh, you're going to move, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get younger for you. You're going to get younger. The kids around you are going to get younger because God's made you for a youth movement. And I knew in that moment that God was calling me back to high school work. And I'm like, what? Like, like just, but it was like this joyful, what? Are you kidding me, Lord? You know, that there would be an intersection of my life and call with a younger generation once again. <clears throat> It reflected, it took me back in that moment to an encounter, a day I spent with an old prophetic man uh, named Bob Jones some years ago. Now, uh, I, you know, I respect this man, admire the way God's used him. I also have conflict with some of the teachings and practices and, you know, um, you know another talk for another time. <laughs> Nevertheless, when he held my wife's and I's hands, he says, I see two callings on you. He says, revelation, prophecy, and power evangelism, and you're going to go to the youth of this nation and he began to just share how to carry that word since 2011. <clears throat> so here I am in 2016, and Amy Ward's telling me, You're gonna, it's going to get younger because God's made you for a youth movement. One of the interesting things about um, learning the ways of God is um, I, I've never found a prophetic person who's really good with timing. I used to always tell people as I train people in prophecy, I said, your friends can help you discern meaning, but you really need elders in your life to help you discern timing. And one of the elders in my life was named Jerry Fry. He's a great man of God, a papa of the faith, who poured into my life and rescued my life more than one time. And uh, when he came to the end of his season of life and he backed away from ministry, I knew I, I needed a father. And his son, Jerry's son, uh, son, Steve, was in my life. And so I literally moved to the cross country, moved my family and my team across country to be in proximity to a spiritual father. So when I talk about intergenerational partnership, I'm not talking about something that I'm not committed to. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? So we ended our ministry, laid off staff team, took a year off, moved across country, and planted our lives in a different part of the nation where I only had one, well, I only had one friendship, and it was really with a spiritual dad. I'm committed to the concept of a multi generational expression of the kingdom. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I said, Steve, I'm not coming on your staff team. I'm not going to be a pastor on your staff. I just need to be around you, and I'll serve your ch the church at the point of my gift, and it'll be amazing. But I need to be free to carry on with the mission God's given me, and I want you to be free. And so in 2017, we moved to Franklin, Tennessee, planted our lives there with this dream of a new student movement. In August of 2017, a month, 30 day, or less than 30 days after we moved there, the Lord visits me with a dream. I alluded to it last night, a dream about a new student harvest of high school students. The Lord spoke to me. It's so, and he was so serious that in the work of harvesting, I, could, I was not to neglect the dirty work of discipleship. Then number three, that the message of identity would be a key that would unlock the heart of the next generation. I, I would love to unpack the dream, but I don't have the time. I think, it, I think it's valuable for especially the charismatic movement, though, because there were some corrections there for us. Nevertheless, I set my heart to this. Lord, Lord, I want to see it. Lord, let it be. A year later, my entire team falls apart. People who moved with us across country just jump ship for a variety of reasons. And here I am with more words of the Lord than I can count, more sacrifices than I can really pay for. I'm looking down the barrel of a reality of a life of faith and going, Lord, I still trust you. There were some ugly moments too, and there were some breakdown moments, and there were moments where my wife and I are sitting on the couch of our pastor saying, help us. <laughs> I knew we were walking in the word of the Lord. I just also knew it was costly and it was ugly. 
a year later, 2019, two years after our move, um, almost two years after our move, um, a gentleman in our church comes up to me. Keep in mind, I live in the South now. This gentleman is a prophetic man, um, and he, uh, he comes alongside me. He says, Adam, the Lord's given me a word for you. He's going to give you a new 22. I'm like, man, I've been in the South like 18 months, and already I'm getting these like Republican Second Amendment prophetic words from people. You know, it's like, it's like I don't even like guns. You know, like I, I'm from California. I associate guns with gang violence. You know, like a new 22. He says, it's not about guns. God's going to give you a new 20, 21, 22-year-olds who are going to come alongside of you, and together you're going to reach high school students all throughout this county. And I said, that's a word of the Lord. Yeah, and he had no idea what was burning in my heart. I said, that's the word of the Lord. I began to pray into it, hold on to this for months, just lean into God with this. I'd walk campuses across our county, pray, cry, just give my heart to the Lord, say, Lord, you have to do something. Here I am. It was actually months go by. Here we are now in... And later in 2019, and uh, our friend Karen Hall emails us, Ryan Hall's wife, and she, they're the directors of the Franklin P Prayer House, Franklin, Tennessee. She says, I don't know if this is a God dream. It kind of seemed like it was. In the dream, my wife Jenny is prophesying, and she's saying, a new student movement has begun in the state of California and in the state of Washington. But then my wife points and prophesies, but every school in Williamson County, that's the county we live in in Tennessee, is open to us. The presence of the Lord fills the dream and they look in the sky and there's a blimp in the sky that's written the words, the time is now. But one of the synergies I want the, 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 the story to highlight today is not just a multi-generational synergy and the importance of that, but there's a synergy, a gift synergy there's something dynamic that happens when the people of God operate together. When the prophetic function ministers to the apostolic or the evangelistic function. And it, it helps us build what God wants to build. Say amen. Here I am just carrying a multiplicity of words. No fulfillment. Someone comes alongside and says, God's going to give you a new 22. I said, that's what I need. I need a team, Lord. I can't reach high school students. I'm pushing 40. Walking on campus, I'm just going to be the pervert 40-year-old <laughs> trying to make a friend. Super weird. Like, Lord, I need a 20-year-old who think I'm cool because a 16-year-old thinks the 20-year-old's cool. You got to make it happen, Lord. I'm here in a state where I have no 20-year-old friends. <laughs> and so the prophetic synergy helps us narrow the target of what God wants, where he wants to build, what he wants to do. What are, what are his designs? <laughs> and so the dream, it, we took this dream. Ironically, it, the dream was received via email. My wife comes downstairs as elders from our church are leaving. We had just formed a missional partnership to help fund, in part, some of my time to be given to a student movement in Middle Tennessee. They're leaving my house as the, the phone uh, with the email hits my hand. The time is now. It's about every school in the county. So now it wasn't just about high school students. God was narrowing us. Every school in Williamson County is open to us. That's the synergy that happens when the true prophetic function meets the apostolic or the evangelistic function. God narrows your focus. Here's where I want you to build. So I actually stopped leading an FCA huddle in Davidson in Nashville, and I came down to, to Franklin where I lived. I didn't have an open door there. I just had a prophetic word. And the time is now. God, God can speak to timing. I've gotten timing wrong t tons of times over the years. But now he's making it plain. The time is now. Like, Lord, okay, I think I trust you on this one. I'm, I'm going for it. Three months go by. I'm praying into this word. I do an evangelism training seminar for um, a group of college students from around the state of Tennessee. I was invited into someone else's ministry to do this. The Lord speaks to me before I do the seminar, and he says, I'm going to give you your new 22 this weekend. I said, all right, well, I'm around college students. It's got to happen here. And so I did my two seminars. God lit up the room. It was amazing. And then I was done, so I went and sat in the foyer. 
Because I'm like, what? God said he'd do it. I'm going to come sit down. So I came and sat in the foyer like, Lord, you have to do something. Minutes go by. Two young men come and sit with me. A 20-year-old 20, a 20 and a 21-year-old. They happen to be the most dynamic young men in the room. They sat down with me. They said, Adam, the whole time you were speaking, our hearts are burning. One of them just came home from YWAM DTS. And he says, I feel like we're all supposed to partner together to reach high school students all throughout this county. I said, I think so. <laughs> and he says, awesome. He's like, by the way, I have this dream to relaunch this simple gathering that I started when I was in high school. I said, what, what, what was the gathering? He says, it was called Wilco United, Williamson County United. He says, I have a dream to gather students from every school in the county. He says, but the Lord's been speaking to me. He says, I feel like I'm not supposed to do this unless I have an older mentor, partner, coach. He says, God showed me that I'm a young leader and I actually need a father. There needs to be a father of this movement. He said, uh, will you be like the dad of this new student movement? <laughs> Here's what I said. Yes. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not asking just to like pray for this thing or like be a prayer partner. Like, like uh, uh, you're going to have to pray about this because I'm asking you if you would like help me, team with me to lead this thing. I said, I've heard from God. We're, we're supposed to team together. He says, all right. So we went, here, God, now we step into fulfillment time. Okay. So you see multi-generational synergies happening at different levels. One cost me moving across country. The next generation, it costs them an invitation. Multi for multi-generational collaboration, it's always more costly for the older generation. Because you, weigh, you stand against the lies of the enemy which says you're put out to pasture, you're irrelevant, you're not needed. It's always more costly for you because you have to resist with everything inside of you by the grace of God, the deception force of the enemy that's trying to, keep, that's trying to isolate a generation. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it, we can always point to the hype, the, 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 even the supernatural exploits and the gatherings of the next generation that are led by young people that are divorced from the older generation and go, oh, they've, they've already got it under, they've already got it. It's a lie of the enemy. They don't got it. They actually need moms and dads. So there's a poetry to this. It's, it's more costly. It costs me moving across country. It cost him an invitation. We began, at, we began to strategize. Well, how, how are we going to gather students from every school in the county? What are we going to do? I said, guys, we need to pray. We need to listen to God. That's the benefit of multi-generational synergy. Sometimes the next generation knows the question to ask, but the older generation knows how to ask. Who to ask? We got to go before God. But... The older generation knows the ways of God. The younger generation knows the, the needs of their generation. So we come together, we begin to pray. And then the young man, one of the young men says, we've heard of this trend in our county. Students are already gathering in our county together. Really, what's going on? He says, well, one of the students we've heard about, he's a junior in high school. His dad's wealthy, gave him a business loan. The junior in high school started a business, and he's making a ton of money. What is he doing? He's hosting raves. Not Christian Bible studies, raves, ns, 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 you know, like, and everything that comes with it, hosting these epic parties. So these young men says, what if we're not supposed to invite, or what if the way God wants to start that, this is we go where kids are already gathered? And I'm like, you know, I think I've read some missiology books about this. I like you guys, you know. I said, well, what do you have in mind? They, the next week we gathered the young men and says, well, we found out where they live. Who? The leaders of the raves. And what do you want to do? He says, she, he says well, what if, what if these guys are like the sons of peace that you talk about, Adam? Like people who are bridges to another community to reach a whole new community for the sake of the gospel. What if we can have a relationship with these rave guys? What if God would use that relationship to reach all of these kids that are already gathered? It's like, man, I freaking love you guys. Like, you're cr just crazy enough, you know? I think we can do something. 
Let's pray. The next thing you know, these two young partners of mine that I'm mentoring develop a relationship with these two boys who are leading these raves, already gathering hundreds of kids from across the county. They begin meeting with them every week. We're praying for these kids. They're having encounters with the Spirit of God. These are unrepentant, rebellious party kids. But they're meeting with my guys every week. Because a 20-year-old has access to the heart of a 17, 18-year-old that maybe a 40-year-old can't get very easily. Does that make sense? So there's an intergenerational synergy here that was undeniable. <clears throat> In the course of time, we pitched these kids. We said, hey, what, what if we went into business partnership with you all? What do you mean? Well, we're going to bring X amount of paying customers to your next rave. But the, we get the microphone at the end of the rave to preach the gospel. God's given you influence in your generation, but he wants to use that influence for eternity, not just waste it and party. We challenged them. Unrepentant party kids, but they wanted to make some money. Can you even do this in evangelism? I don't know. We did. <laughs> and, so, and so we began planning Lord, what happens if 100 kids come to Christ? And so I produce, I'm like, the Lord told me we can't neglect discipleship, but what if kids come from other counties, and how are we going to do this? And I, I built a, a text-in tool, text-in Jesus to this short code at the altar, and then they get on a drip campaign that we've already pre-prepared, and I produce these 10, one- to two-minute discipleship through the videos using these young people that I'm leading in my, my old face, and we, we were teaching kids in one- and two-minute increments the way of Jesus. The, the hope was from the very, their very first day they, they put their faith in Christ, they would be on a drip campaign and straight to their phone they'd get these two-minute videos every day. We just had to do something. That's what happens with multi-generational synergy. You, you, you have the capacity to use technology that's maybe not even available to you as a 50, 60, 70-year-old. But then you get in the life of a 40-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 20-year-old, and all of a sudden you can use today's vehicles for reaching today's generation. Does that make sense? <clears throat> and so we get a phone call from a venue in downtown Nashville called Rocket Town. You guys are doing exactly what we're supposed to do. We've been called to do, but we've not do been doing it for years. Rocket Town's a state-of-the-art venue downtown Nashville. It was pioneered by a man named Michael W. Smith. They said, we want to partner together. What if we, what if we did a bigger thing all together? And we flipped the bill, but you guys led the thing. And it would help you give a, bit, a bigger partnership with these rave kids, you know. And we're like, we're in. So we moved the rave into downtown Nashville. A thousand paying customers show up. And we brought in this anointed DJ from Dallas who, who loves the Lord. We brought in different people just to contribute. And our young people preached the gospel at the end of the rave, these young disciples of mine. And at the end of the gospel call, 400 young people respond. 400 young people respond in the heart of this rave. It wasn't a Jesus rave by any means. It wasn't a Jesus. <laughs> my phone is getting lit up with all the text ins. My phone's like, ns, 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 ns. Like, that's awesome. So what we said is we're going we're gonna to use this text in campaign to invite them to our first Wilco United event. The strategy being we're going to go where they are, raves. We're going to invite them to a neutral space, Wilco United, a space that's not owned by any singular church or ministry or name so that it can take on more of an identity of a movement. That's the beauty of not just multi-generational synergies and collaboration, but multi-church, multi-ministry collaboration. Because now you have a capacity to operate as a movement, not just a territorial organization. So if you're a church, you're a competitor. But if you're a movement, you can potentially be a bridge to local churches. So here we are then. Our, our first Wilco United event and 400 kids shows up. Now, I've started ministries over the years. I've never started them like this, you know, where it's like first event. Okay, 400 kids. Here we are. What? Do, okay preach the gospel, there's healings, there's deliverance, there's prophetic release, there's 200 kids at the altar at the end of the night, 
giving their lives to Jesus. I mean, it was just this wild thing. We picked the leaders. We began to walk in discipleship with them. We're gonna, we said, well, let's do this again. We host another rave. We host another Wilco United. And in three months' time, we saw 800 kids come to faith in Christ. And we were just in the thick of it, doing the works of Jesus. And then the pandemic hits. Disruption. <clears throat> We seek the Lord again. The next year launches, school year launches. We pick more leaders, student leaders from all the county. We invite them into discipleship relationship because I'm the older guy who's done discipleship schools and has made disciples. I'm writing the curriculum. I'm, I'm forging hearts in the ways of God. I'm working with my younger leaders. We're collaborating all together, young and old, with the 40-year-old, the 20-year-old, and the teenagers to host these collaborative revival events called Wilco United. And the next thing you know, our events I had consistently had four, five, six hundred young people at them when we would gather throughout the year. I began convening youth pastors. Why? Because I'm an old guy, older than most youth pastors, who doesn't work for a church. So I'm not a threat to anyone. So I began convening youth pastors with a catered dinner. And we make it pretty and we dignify it and we have prayer and we have a discussion over what it means to make disciples of Gen Z. Then we talk about the dream of walking in for relationship unto the point where the Holy Spirit can breathe on a relationship and we can collaborate together. How many of you know if you partner together without friendship, you're just doing business together? That's not kingdom. So I said, let's create a space for authentic friendship to happen so that if in the ways of God, the Holy Spirit breathes on us and we begin to partner together, it's pure. It's not these youth pastors praying for kids at the altars of the gatherings that we started because we don't want to be a local church. That's not our calling. We want to be a bridge to the local church. We just happen to be a harvesting ministry. But most harvest parachurch harvesting ministries for student ministries are not designed to be a bridge to local churches, but really they're full, they're, the way they operate is they're designed to replace local churches. They don't draw kids into communities of discipleship. They draw kids unto themselves. They have the evangelistic anointing, but in order to maintain their movement, they feel a need to draw kids to themselves and, and instead of drawing kids into discipleship communities and churches. Am I making sense here? So I'm a local church guy. I'm a missions guy. I can see the big picture. I'm like, Lord, can we imagine a, 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 a missional venture that would not replace the local church but be a bridge to the local church? See, when a 20-year-old starts a gathering like this, it can be epic. There can be miracles. There can be large numbers. But at the end of the day, it's just a cool night. But when a 20-year-old partners with a 40-year-old with a vision, all of a sudden you have a more developed philosophy of ministry, a more developed strategy, and it's aligned to the ways of God. Do you know what I'm saying? That can only happen with multi-generational synergies, multi-generational partnerships. <clears throat> I think I just have two minutes left. Lord, help me. A year later, after our first Wilco United event, one of the young men who led the raves um, had a deliverance encounter and, and finally came alive in Christ. And um, he was growing like wild for two months, hungry for God, with a vision to have raves all over the United States that preached the gospel. He's this wild kid, pulled out of drugs and partying, and then he died tragically in a car accident two months later. He was one of the most popular kids in the county. His grieving parents, who do not know Christ, invited our ministry because we were already present in the lives of this family by virtue of connection to the raves to help them with the memorial service. We held the memorial during the pandemic in an outdoor soccer field in Franklin High School where this young man graduated. 2,000 2, people show up to the soccer field for the memorial service. There's a Wilco United worship team leading Jesus music on the stage. There's all of his party friends telling party stories and different stories from the platform. And then a few of us who shared Jake's transformation story the last two months, his deliverance encounter, his love for God. And we began to proclaim the gospel. And we gave a call to salvation. And 500 people stood, including all of Jake's family. We used the same text... We actually used the same texting tool that I designed for the raves, at, for Jake's raves at Jake's memorial service. What the crowd didn't know was Jake was a songwriter. I mean, we live in Nashville, everyone's a songwriter. And so 
But Jake was hanging out with our worship leaders, our, our students. They're writing music together. Everyone has a studio, right? So they're writing, producing music together. No one knew that, that Jake was a songwriter except us. At the end of his gathering, we, we pressed play on a track, and it was a track that Jake wrote two weeks before. He wrote this with our Wilco student worship leaders. He produced it. He sang the track. And the song he wrote was called, I'm Coming Home. And he was declaring his apology to the Lord for not following his ways and giving pr into peer pressure. His apology for Pete to, to his friends for living hi hi hypocritically. And then he was declaring to the Lord, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. He says, it, one of his lines, he says, if Jesus came out of his grave, what's to say that I won't do? I'm coming home. He says, no more chains, no more fear. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And 2,000 people on the football field heard him prophetically singing the reality of his homecoming. You better believe the next Wilco gathering we did weeks later had seven, six, 700 kids in it. See, there's a, something of a, a beauty about what happens when we follow the ways of God, when we allow the prophetic function to have synergy with the apostolic evangelistic function, when, when, when an older leader just says, I'm just going to be present, ministry of presence in the lives of young people. I don't care how awkward it feels. I'm going to defy the awkwardness. I'm going to be present in love and truth and wisdom. And, and when there's an invitation and in the course of time because of friendship, God's going to breathe on this friendship and we're going to collaborate together and we're going to wait on the Lord. We're going to listen to his heart. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna partner with him to do the things that he wants to do, not our best ideas. We're going to do them the ways he wants to do them. And we're going to use even modern resources to affect this generation. These things can only happen when we team together in a multi-generational capacity. My assignment has been, and it will continue to be, as I feel like I've received an impartation from the Lord based on the first stream 2017 after moving to Nashville that to, to create new simple discipleship resources for the student harvest so new identity was the first one that I made years ago I'm actually more proud of the other ones that I've done um, and I'll, I'll just share this one I don't have it available here today um, because they're sold out but I wrote that after working with Gen Z for two years I wrote a simple Bible, Bible study in the Beatitudes uh, upside down Eight crazy statements Jesus made about life and happiness. And I designed this for Gen Z after working with him for a few years. And I designed it with the imagination that someone would use this in a cafeteria and gather friends around the table at, at, the, at a public school and open scripture together. Here's what's happened in our generation is campus ministry has radically changed in this generation in the last few years. Why? Because uh, school districts across the nation have adopted new policies which require campus ministries or clubs to meet only before school, not during the school day. Well, if you meet an hour before everyone else gets to school, you fundamentally undercut any opportunity to reach kids who don't know Christ. This campus ministry has fundamentally changed. So we have to go from an attractional model to an equipping mobilization model where we recognize we still have boots on the ground via kids who are disciples of Jesus in the schools. We need to walk with them and equip them with resources that will empower them to do the works of Jesus themselves on campus. So I'm creating resources that, will, that for the lane in the sphere that God entrusts to us that kids can use. We actually put this Bible study, we saw 700 kids in Middle Tennessee go through this Bible study last year. And um, I just think that's a beautiful thing, you know. Um, we, so we can't have campus clubs with the same effect in most districts. Some districts are still doing lunchtime clubs. We can't have them with the same effect. So we have to reimagine ministry for today's world. Does that make sense? Um, I think that's all my time.